It's recording. It's recording now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the TFEA COVID-19 task <laughs> webinar. Um, today we are, we have four panelists. They are Joe Vera, uh, CFPE Assistant City Manager of the City of McAllen, uh, an IFEA World Board Member, as well as TFEA Chairman of the Board, Yahida Flores, the uh, CVE Director of the City of McAllen Convention Center and McAllen Performing Arts Center. We have Karina Jimenez, who is a Director for the Parks and Recreation uh, department in McAllen, and we have Jessica Bybee Judget, who is um, our Secretary Treasurer on the TFEA Board and Director of Client Operations for Sapphire and an IFEA Association partner. We will be starting in one minute. Passcode's not working. Okay, um, we're going to begin with Jessica. Jessica, you want to start the best practices for festivals, fairs, and events dealing with the COVID world? Sure thing. Thank you so much, Kay. Um, and I also want to thank my co-presenters today. Everybody at the City of McAllen has been doing such a great job of making sure they're staying safe and keeping everyone comfortable while they try to slowly come back to the world of events. Um, and I would say on the Sapphire side of things, we've been able to actually host a few events and, and have some clients who are going forward with some of their events. And so today we're gonna to be talking about some of the best practices that we've seen at events that are actually starting to slowly come back. So I wanted to first just get us started with talking about some of the data. And I wanted to mention, this is information that's available on the IFEA website. And we can include a link in the I'll pull a link up and, and share it in the chat window here with everybody in just a minute. But because we're all IFEA members as TFEA members, uh, we're able to access this information. But it, it's been data that's been pulled together by a lot of organizations that you can see here. And I think the thing that's really promising about the data is that people are really missing events. They want to get back to events. They're ready to get back and celebrate. I think we're all feeling the just the ongoing kind of monotony and dredge of the, of the situation really has us ready to get back to the normalcy of what it means to celebrate with our communities. So um, in this first uh, stat that we pulled up, the folks who are missing live events and their likelihood to return, we're looking at an almost 94% of the people are either missing it very much or missing it somewhat. So that's, a, that's obviously really promising. It, it helps tell us that our festivals that we're putting on for the communities that we live in are impactful and people really are ready to get back to that. Uh, the second stat we have here, this is the likelihood to return to an event once large gatherings are able to resume. And again, we are pretty high. Uh, where we see 54% are extremely likely, 22% are very likely, and 16% are somewhat likely. So again, a good chunk of people who are ready to come back. And when we, we ask about the, you know, 
the smaller percentages of people and why they may not come back, it's really about how safe do they feel and what is what are the things that we need to put into place to make them feel comfortable um, coming back. And I won't read through each of these because we'll provide the slides at, um, on the website after this is over with so that you can access it and look at it, you know, study it a little bit more in your own time. But things that will make people feel comfortable coming back will increase the likelihood that they come back. And that's going to be everything from hand washing stations and sanitizer stations, um, masking and whether or not it's going to be required, of course, is something that's going to affect people's comfort level. Um, we've talked about contactless security screening. Contactless payments is another piece where I'll be talking about at the end of the presentation. We're going to talk about some technology that's been coming out for, um, for social distancing and being able to kind of reduce the number of, of touch points that you have with somebody. Uh, food workers wearing masks, the employees wearing masks. And a lot of this is really about just the appearance. Like people want to know that you're taking it seriously. Um, they want to see how you're communicating it to, to everyone and, and making sure that you're providing a safe environment to come back to. Um, some other safety imp uh, implementations that people are looking for. We've seen some people uh, more likely to attend if you have um, body temperature checks upon entry or you know looking at the stats on whether or not you're reducing the crowd size at any point in time or how often are you cleaning the the germ the surfaces that could collect germs so i would say this is a whole actually much larger document that's available on the ifea site and i'll again i'll send the link through so you can um so you can check it out but in general I think people are ready to get back. They want to come back. And it's just a matter of feeling safe that they can come back. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Joe. And while uh, Joe, you kind of give yourself a little bit of an introduction to your team an introduction, I'm also going to um, switch the hosting over to Yahida so she can share her slides. So Joe, you want to take it away? And your microphone is muted, it looks like, so you'll want to unmute your microphone, Joe. Let's see. Yahida, you want to go ahead and try to talk? There? Oh, there we go. There you go. Now we can hear you, Joe. All right. Great. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jessica, uh, just really fast. If, if you can... Um, you can share your uh, host capabilities with me. I think that you got the, the wrong one. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Joe. All right, well, sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, seems like uh, something we're always having to deal with. But uh, anyhow, great to be on the, on the panel today. I wanna thank Jessica and Kay and Yahida and Karina for uh, for their uh, agreeing to help with this panel discussion this, this afternoon. And also want to thank the TFEA task force for all they do in, in planning these uh, uh, works, these uh, roundtable discussions. Uh, I think we, we all are wanting to get back to celebrating live events again. And uh, I know that uh, in doing so, we, we have to uh, we have to be sure that we make our people feel safe and comfortable and not only our guests, but also our staff and volunteers and uh, need to be following state guidelines. Uh, and as they're relaxed uh, for COVID, then we adjust. And we have been doing a lot of adjusting here in McAllen. Uh, we had planned several events uh, over 4th of July. And uh, unfortunately, our county Hidalgo County is in the top 10 counties now as uh, hot counties in the state of Texas. So we have been having to do a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, pivoting and innovating and uh, modifying and adjusting. And so uh, it, uh, it's just something that we, that we have to do. And, and this is just such a ongoing situation, a moving very, very volatile. Uh, I know that several events have had to cancel. Uh, uh, events like uh, Fiesta San Antonio that had been rescheduled for uh, 
November has now had to be uh, rescheduled for 2021. State Fair of Texas has also had to cancel and uh, now scheduled for 2021. Uh, I know Grape Fest and, uh, and Grapevine and the Worst Fest in New Braunfels also had to cancel and, uh, and reschedule for 2021. And then I know the Tournament of Roses Parade also had to cancel and, and uh, go to 2021. So as excited as we are about getting back to celebrating, uh, we have to certainly make sure that health and safety is, is the first thing that we consider and, and we're all being very careful about that. Uh, I had hoped that uh, we would be, when we talked about doing the session, we were actually talking about having a discussion of uh, some of the best practices of what, uh, of what we'd gone through over the 4th of July events and other events that we had planned here in the community. Uh, I can tell you that we are probably on draft number 10 of our reopening gu guidelines. Uh, our staff has worked very hard to make sure that we're doing everything that we're complying with the, the state of Texas and the governor's uh, uh, reopening uh, uh, platforms. And, uh, and so uh, having said that, we've, we've gone into having to, to plan other events here that I think are our, our panelists here in McAllen will be able to share some, some of the, some of those uh, learned experiences that we had. Uh, we've, uh, we had our summer camp that, that we planned uh, for some of our parks departments and uh, our reopening protocols uh, didn't quite go as we thought they would go. And so I think that those are some good lessons learned that we'll be able to, to share with you all uh, we also had uh, to plan a memorial service uh, at our convention center for two police officers that were slain on the job on their job uh, here at the city of McAllen uh, while they were serving the community. Uh, type of event that probably none of us would want to plan. And then last, uh, just this this week. Uh, we opened an alternative care facility for COVID patients at our McAllen Convention Center. So we'll be able to share some of that information with you uh, as uh, we go through this, uh, through this discussion uh, this afternoon. Yohaida? Thank you, Mr. Veda. We've, we've, like, like Mr. Veda mentioned, we've put together many, many, many versions of what this together again reopening plan and protocols are um, that we have in place are. And we had planned to start a soft reopening in the beginning of July. And just as we were planning um, late June, we saw a surge in cases in, in the Rio Grande Valley and we decided to hold by, back on our reopening. Since then, we have had these two um, completely unprecedented and different bookings that we've never planned to have and um, and we have learned a lot from. The first is um, a uh, memorial for 1400 people at the McAllen Convention Center uh, for our two fallen officers and just now what we're seeing is uh, opening and reopening protocols as a to repurpose the convention center into a COVID hospital or an alternate care site. Um, our reopening plan consisted of four different points. Uh, first, it was a gradual reopening based on limited seating capacities and physical, physical distancing in all of our event spaces. So uh, at the Convention Center and Performing Arts Center, we have about 18 different event spaces that we're able to use. And we went through every space and looked at every configuration to see what our new maximum capacities would be for, for each one. Uh, we've completely changed our cleaning and sanitation protocols. And this is continually changing as well as we get evidence-based information on what the, the best way to sanitize our buildings are, the best um, 
the how to sanitize our high touch points, uh, the difference between electrostatic cleaners and foggers and sprayers and, and what we need to use. And, and at the end of the day, I think that we're all getting bombarded with so much information on what the best process is. What we're learning is that there's no one size fits all process for the cleaning and sanitation uh, protocol because this has never been done before and this virus is completely new. Um, from you know HEPA filters to blue light, uh, UV lights inside the HVAC to everything else that we're using, we just need to stay on top of the science and, and stay on top of the data to make sure that we're doing things correctly. Uh, with that, there's extensive employee training and health protocols that we're following, constantly monitoring what the latest evidence is and constantly monitoring what the CDC health protocols are along with our healthcare providers. And then uh, screening and prevention support is part of our reopening plan where we have uh, measures for ingress and egress, conduct temperature checks and uh, have virus exposure related questions to our guests as they're coming into the facilities, as well as our vendors, as well as our employees. And again, this, is an evolving document that continuously changes. We'd be happy to share the information that we've learned along the way with any panel or with anybody that's listening to this webinar. So here are four different parts of the reopening plan, which is the phase reopening, cleaning and sanitation, extensive training and health protocols, and screening and prevention support. One of the things that we've noticed along the way, unfortunately, with the events that we've had is one thing is to implement the policies and procedures and the second thing is how people will react to those policies and procedures will they adhere to those policies will they be in compliance or not um, so for the memorial that we had we had set out groups of four seats and the idea was that if you came in, you came by yourself, or if you gave, came in a group of one, two, or three people, you would sit in that four seat pod, and nobody would sit right next to you. But as the uh, building got more and more full or at capacity, people started st from different groups started sitting in those four seat pods. So one of the things that we've learned we've learned early on is if there is a seat there, somebody will sit down. And so as we are looking at reopening, it's taking those things into consideration. Um, do we have to physically remove seats from the area? Uh, how do we create these boundaries where we don't allow for a congregation of people that, where we can move traffic uh, efficiently? And, um, and how do we uh, enforce the requirements that we have? So our first initiative with our phase reopening is to open the McAllen Performing Arts Center at a 250 seat capacity. Our building is 1,846 seats. 250 max capacity would put us at 12% of the building. The reason why we would like to open at 12% of the building is to be able to monitor that human behavior, to see how long it, uh, it takes to conduct temperature checks and ask the virus related questions, to see how long it takes to uh, scan a ticket or go through the entire process and how people react along the way is equally as important. The idea is to have first come self seating the reason why we want first come self seating is so that you don't have to cross paths with anybody else and we can manage the ingress and egress. And then also not only killing the seats in between groups, but killing every single other row, meaning there will be nobody sitting directly in front of you and nobody sitting directly behind you. Here's a sample of what the seating uh, chart would look like depending on how many people come in groups, what we've laid out is groups of two and groups of four. We have um, six foot, a minimum of six feet physical distancing. It's a very limited seating capacity, screening and prevention support, distancing indoors and public areas, one way routing. So you go in one way and you go out the other. That way people are not walking through aisles in different directions and you don't have to make those aisles 12 to 15 feet uh, wider. 
reducing bottlenecks. And then the, the last thing is uh, being able to manage arrival times. So having different arrival times for different areas of the building as well. With this first initiative, we would have designated personnel to greet the, uh, visitors to the facility. Uh, we would require face masks. We would have infrared non-contact thermometers uh, placed at the designated entry points. Now, if somebody uh, does not pass the initial screening, they are taken to a secondary screening site where we can get more information um, on why they did not uh, pass their uh, initial screening. For ticketed events, guests should be screened prior to showing their ticket and ideally prior to entering the building. Signage is placed um, in strategic locations, making sure that our attendees and our guests are uh, listening to our physical distancing and social distancing standards, that they, they are complying with face masks, um, so on and so forth. And this messaging would start at the parking lot, um, not only have the messaging through signage, but also have the messaging through any form of communication. So a few things that we've noticed is how to incorporate uh, these new standards, our new normal, into our everyday life and do it in a creative way. So here's an example of what a museum did in New York. They installed plexiglass between the attendee and the employee, and they did it in a really nice art form. And so with that is trying to incorporate the way that we do business in a creative way while pe so people could follow the rules. A few memes that I've seen online are the following in terms of social distancing and face masks. Be like Darth Vader, he wears a mask. He doesn't visit his son and daughter. He's socially and emotionally distanced and he follows orders. Uh, my personal favorite, and you might have seen it already, is Freddie Mercury. No mask on your face, you big disgrace, spreading your germs all over the place. This is very creative for a music uh, concert or you know, just to have outside um, uh, in your concert space. Um, more examples of art, he wants to wear a mask, but he can't. If you don't wear a mask, you'll stay in history with him. And, and these are just some creative examples of, let's get that message across. Let's make sure that it's part of our messaging, but let's do it in a way that we can speak to our attendees in, in, in a creative way. Our second initiative is uh, to conduct our first outdoor concert. And you've seen these uh, different um, social distancing pods, probably in parks around the country, uh, something um, Central Park first did. And so th this idea was something that we were gonna launch 4th of July. Again, because of the surge in the Rio Grande Valley, we weren't able to launch this concert, but we had these 10 foot pods that were socially distanced from each other, where we physically spray painted um, the, the pod on the ground and crowds were supposed to stay within their area. Hopefully we'll be able to implement um, a small music uh, concert soon where we could see how these would work. Again, it's one way traffic. It's also doing temperature checks. This is something that we are looking at closely because since it's an outdoor event, will that raise the temperature of the attendees that are coming? And if so, do we need to have an air conditioned area for them? Uh, so on and so forth. Now I'll have Karina talk about the 4th of July initiatives that we were actually able to, to do. Karina, I believe that you're on mute. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Thanks, Yahida. So um, initiative number three, we really, uh, in the months when, after the implementation of our operational changes citywide, which was about mid-March, we really started that conversation of how are we going to celebrate Independence Day? How are we going to do it in a safe um, way and kind of have that offering for um, members of our community who are looking for that opportunity. 
Um, as you can imagine, like we've all said, it's ever changing. It's, you know, hard to keep up with. I was just on a call for IFEA um, a moment ago, and we were all tasked with submitting, um, you know, kind of what's going on in our communities and our states. And what the leads of that group said was they got so much useful information, but it was just so hard to pinpoint um, consistencies and similarities. So just for us, we, you know, it constantly evolved. We started with about 30 different ideas that we thought um, seemed feasible and that we could implement. And as, you know, our COVID-19 situation continued to evolve and the event budget became more defined, and we really got a good pulse on the community's point of view on an event, uh, we evaluated that the final list would look like what you see on the screen. So our McAllen Parks Unplugged, which is our online recreation program that we've launched in response to COVID-19, the virtual independence 4K run, our best of Independence Day broadcast, and our virtual contest offerings were all done virtually. So we knew that there would be minimal challenges in terms of um, the participants celebrating safely and they would still be able to um, provide the opportunity for us to create ROI opportunities for our partners, which is really important um, during this time. So those were kind of um, more, you know, straightforward in terms of how we executed them and they had a really great uh, response. We did deliver the winners their prizes for the virtual contest with our mo mobile recreation um, team, our rec squad that was also created in response to COVID-19 as a way to kind of stay top of mind with our community center participants. And uh, during those deliveries, our staff did practice social distancing. They wore masks and gloves and they did contact the winners prior to ask them to stay in their home as they were setting up their prizes and then our staff stepped away and the winners were able to come out um you know take a good look at what it is that they had won and of course we were able to capture that moment um, with video and photo so we implemented definitely the safety measures and the physical distancing during that delivery process when it came to floats on parade and the distribution of the at-home craft kits, uh, we implemented a, a few safeguards. We, as we kind of drilled down on how we would implement these two, we decided rather than have them as two standalone elements of the event and, um, you know, feature them at two different locations, we combined the two um, as one place where attendees could go and essentially have these two experiences. For floats on parade, we had 15 different floats stationed throughout the city um, that participants could visit, um, take a look at, take a photo. So what we did uh, to kind of, you know, make sure that that was a, a safe way to celebrate was we had a staff member at all of the float locations throughout the city um, to ensure one that the visitors were practicing physical distancing. We placed a floor decal in front of the float in an effort to kind of define that space where the photo opportunity would be able to happen and promote you know only one group photo at a time we also had uh, poly dots and cones at each of the float locations in the event that uh, we did have you know a larger amount of groups at one at the float at one time to uh, be able to give the staff the tools that they would need uh, if they needed to create a traffic control plan, um, execute the traffic control plan in terms of placing those poly dots or cones six feet apart from each other and kind of forming the attendee line that way. In terms of the craft kit distribution, we had 3,000 craft kits that we needed to distribute throughout the day. So we kind of discussed different ways to do that. We had seen, you know, several um, times throughout the, the months since March where, you know, you could drive up at different places and get uh, cleaning kits or whatever the case may be, something for, you know, the senior citizen population. And we had seen it um, distribution like those done in different ways. One of the ones that we explored was setting a table out um, and the kids would be placed on the table by our staff member who again was wearing masks and gloves throughout the entire day. 
um, and having the attendee pick up the bag, their kits from the table. As we drilled down more with that, we thought it might be um, it, more appealing and you know add to the comfort of those coming by if we didn't have these uh, uh, kits on a table where say my family goes and grabs two bags, but the family behind me is supposed to grab the two bags that I left there and essentially maybe you know touched or whatever the case may be. So what we we did was we had our staff um, again uh, distribute the bag directly to uh, or the kids excuse me directly to the attendee uh, in an effort to kind of um, again add that level of security in their minds. The seventh event that we had within the Independence Day celebration was our concert in the sky fireworks extravaganza. As we know, as Yahida mentioned in the week leading up to 4th of July, the situation with COVID-19 rapidly changed and the concert in the sky element of the Independence Day celebration was reevaluated. Uh, we determined that though we knew we could secure the park area where traditionally that event was held, um, the streets and the parking lots adjacent to the firing site uh, could not be close to the public. So therefore, we chose not to move forward uh, with the event the week of 4th of July. So I think um, one difference between maybe our approach and uh, um, others is that we, we move forward um, until, you know, we hear otherwise, until we, we continue to monitor the situation and make the appropriate changes. So we were able to execute quite a bit of our plan. And once again, it was uh, more in a virtual from a virtual point of view. Uh, our initiative number four that we also were able to implement was uh, our reopening plan for athletic facilities. We, uh, all of our departments across the organization have created their reopening plans. Our parks and recreation reopening plan um, includes within it a section on athletic facilities. So the the athletic facility section does include um, department responsibilities as well as users, our association and organizations. Some of the things under the department responsibilities are that we will deep clean the facility prior to reservation start date. Um, this included the amenities such as bleachers, restrooms, etc. And it, it was very, um, our reopening plan in terms of the uh, disinfecting is very similar to what you had already touched on. Um, um, very much in line with the approach of how we would um, move forward with that. And our users are required to submit their action plan for approval just to ensure that it's in line with uh, what we've defined as the um, appropriate steps to move forward. Uh, some things that we're looking at it, within that user action plan is their communication notification plan, their emo emergency protocols, and their safety guidelines. So will they be doing temperature checks, et cetera? Will they be asking those uh, symptom questions? The condition of the premises, we would be open to use after the deep cleaning of the amenities. The bleachers would not be available for use. The restrooms and concessions were available. CDC signage is placed throughout with sanitary practice and distance messaging at the gates, the restrooms, concession building, uh, fields, et cetera. We had signage at the dugouts and the fields defining one entry point and one exit point uh, into the field and the dugouts. We, we also had our concession stands outfitted with plexiglass shields, uh, social distancing decals uh, leading out from the concession to form that line. And um, we also um, required that, uh, just kind of going with the, con with the concessions, that all of the the items were prepackaged, as Yahida had mentioned before. In terms of the user's responsibility, they are res responsible for implementing their safety guidelines at the gate, temperature checks, system question, sy symptom questionnaires, just to ensure the safety for all. Uh, we felt that those steps, along with the prepackaged concession items, and um, you know, making sure that they were implementing that would um, assist with our limitation of liability. In terms of the, ex the being able to implement our plan, we were able to do this for a, a weekend tournament a few weeks ago. 
Um, it turned out well in terms of both parties, the department and the user implementing um, our plans. We did have a facility manager on site to ensure that distancing practices this were followed and that the plans submitted to us by the user were being implemented the way that they had been presented for approval. And we did have on-site staff practicing, you know, normal facility operations just as they would prior to COVID-19, um, emptying of trash cans, etc. Uh, we were able to have our facilities open for about a week and a half. Uh, we did reclose our athletic facilities in response to the COVID-19 surge of cases that we were seeing and are still seeing in our region. So that's kind of um, where we are, but we did have, we're able to have that, you know, um, opportunity to implement some of those and we saw positive um, results from that. So just some, some things to take into consideration as we move forward with the, uh, our new normal is ticket refunds. Currently, we are refunding 100% of tickets, um, sp specifically with any issues related to COVID-19. Um, but as we start getting into our program season, um, how, how do we want to manage the ticket refund policy? How does your venue or your events manage the ticket refund policy? Is it no questions asked? Is it something that's related to um, health and safety? And, and so those ticket refund policies have to be um, really considered before we go on sale with any event. The next thing is indemnification. Once people are coming to um, our events or our facilities, uh, do we have the proper indemnification? Um, what is the exposure um, that the facility would bring to, um, to an event? Um, are we liable for any, anybody that comes to our facilities in terms of the level of exposure that they get if they get sick with COVID-19? Um, like I didn't mention the condition of the premises, um, what will the facility be responsible as well as the uh, event user, the limitation of liabilities and making sure that we're compliance, uh, we are in compliance with laws and rules of the premises. So Disney does everything well. Um, we have looked at what their COVID-19 statements are as well as different venues across the country and different events that have already implemented um, or that have, have already been staged throughout the country. Theirs is something that's very straightforward. We have taken enhanced health and safety measures for you, our other guests and cast members. You must follow post instructions while visiting Walt Disney World Resort. An inherent risk of exposure to COVID-19 exists in any public place where people are present. COVID-19 is an extremely contagious disease that could lead to severe illness and death. According to the Centers for Disease Control, and prevention. Seniors, senior citizens and guests with underlying medical conditions are especially vulnerable. Here's a kicker. By visiting Walt Disney World Resort, you voluntarily assume all risks related to exposure to COVID-19. Help keep each other healthy. So this information is posted on their website. It is also posted uh, before entering any of their theme parks and it is also posted um, as you go into their theme park. So there's various areas where uh, Walt Disney World Resort is uh, telling their guests that they voluntarily assume all risks related to exposure to COVID-19. Just some quick information. Will people come to our events once we are open? 59% of uh, attendees and uh, believe that visiting an, an arena or stadium would increase their likelihood to contract coronavirus. 64% of people will continue maintaining social distancing even after recommendations have eased. 70% of people report not being comfortable attending sporting events after social distancing restrictions have eased. And 90% of uh, Americans spend their time indoors. So when we take this into consideration um, and we look at the mass gatherings that we produce, we still, uh, in terms of mass gatherings, have the highest risk related to COVID-19. 
and we need to be very careful how we reopen and what reopening protocols we have in place. Uh, just really quick, ADA and face masks. The CDC states that a person who has trouble breathing is unconscious, incapacitated, or otherwise, otherwise unable to remove their face mask without assistance should not wear a face mask or face cloth covering. And the reason why I add this is because in most of our counties right now, there is a face mask requirement. However, we need to know what the ADA compliance with face masks are. And with that, I'm going to give host capabilities back to Jessica so she can go over the latest uh, in technology. Thank you so much, Yohaira. All right, let me get back to sharing my screen here. And while I pull that up, I am going to also go ahead and send you all the link to that research that I was referring to. So in the chat window of the, of the Zoom meeting, you should see a link to get to the full documented research for um, that IFEA has shared on the site. Um, I wanted to just touch a little bit on some of the technology um, that we're seeing come into place. And uh, like both Karina and Yahida mentioned, we're definitely at the mercy of our, our government entities telling us what we're able to do and not able to do. Um, and so certainly, um, you know, we're trying to take the guidance from those those governmental entities and then we're also finding ourselves working with some other organization type entities to make sure we're implementing correctly what what they want as we sell tickets to their events so um, first and foremost we are seeing changes in the technology especially where it comes to the ticketing side of things we're seeing that several of our clients are either encouraged like further encouraging people buy their tickets in advance or we're actually starting to see some of our clients actually requiring that you purchase your tickets in advance. Um, they're looking at uh, trying to get away from having that transactional process with somebody at a box office window. And that's of course gonna be different per event and what your capabilities are per event. Uh, I wouldn't say that we've been able to see that happen with necessarily our reserved seating events, but we have seen it with at least one of our fairs that has happened. Uh, and actually what they ended up doing, because it was such a scaled back version of their fair this year, they ended up saying, we're going to go ahead and make all of the tickets free to the public, but we're going to still require that you claim your ticket. And then they also did timed entry. So they basically said, you're, you're going to be claiming your comp ticket to come at a certain 30 minute time window. So. That's something you might want to consider. We're seeing that across the board with a lot of our organizations we work with. Um, we have a museum that we work with up in the Northeast, so it's not really a fair or a festival, but it's, it's a, it is a, an attraction that people come to on a daily basis and they need to limit the capacity of people who are in at one time. And so they're just requiring that you buy those in advance um, and, and for a certain time slot. Once you're actually in that ticket purchasing process, you wanna make sure you're really making it clear to your customers what the expectations will be as far as mask requirements. And like Yahida mentioned, uh, go ahead and you know, include whatever ADA information you need to include to make sure you're in compliance. But you wanna also clearly let customers know what the distancing rules are going to be, what safety and cleaning procedures you, you're going to have in play, and that risk policy like what we saw with the Walt Disney World um, using that kind of language to make sure that when the customer is either purchasing a ticket or claiming their ticket for your event that they're going to be taking on the risk themselves uh, in, in, in light of whatever, what all is going on in the world of COVID. And then also like I had mentioned making sure you're clearly stating those refund and exchange policies so that it's clear what's going to happen if in the event the event does need to cancel. I know we don't have a ton of reserved seating events within the room, um, so I'm not going to spend too, too much time on it, but if you have a space that wasn't previously reserved seating, you might want to consider um, blocking it off as though it is reserved seating because it does help give the picture of what that looks like. And so one of the new technology tools we're seeing within reserved seating tools is that you can now have a different 
indicator that indicates that these are empty for social distancing. This is actually for a rodeo that we're going on sale with um, coming up here in Texas. And it's interesting because obviously different counties have different rules. Um, some of them are sticking truer to the 50% capacity that's allowed right now. Um, and, and so it's really going to be dependent on what your your county approves. This one is a PBR event. And so we're also really strictly communicating what the PBR organization as a whole wants us to communicate. So um, they basically have incorporated a whole cowboy safe, be cowboy safe program that it outlines uh, what they're doing with their staff, what they're doing with their cowboys. They're doing testing amongst the staff of the facility as well as the staff of their organization. And they're making sure that they're doing temperature checks with both the Cowboys, the staff workers of the, of the facility. And they're making sure that the public is aware of that so that they can feel safe coming into the facility. Um, and that's a requirement for PBR. So even though I'm just personally going to be there on site to help work the event as their ticketing platform, I too am gonna be COVID tested because PBR is, a, is having that as a requirement. So um, just making sure you're clearly communicating it. And I think this gives customers a, a certain comfort level to see, okay, like I can buy these three seats and know that I'm not gonna have anybody on the left or right of me or anybody directly in front of me. Another, um, another I, I feel like this is a really creative thing that we've seen people utilizing if they have fairground spaces or if you have public spaces that you're able to utilize and you're just looking for a way to kind of drive any revenue possible, We've, we're starting to see a lot more drive-in events. And so uh, the drive-in movies, of course, have been extremely popular because you are able to stay socially distant. And so if you, uh, you know, having some more mobile ticketing options has become way more popular in this past uh, four months or so than it was even prior to. So being able to just have the, the ticket printers there on your hip and being able to service the cars as they pull up. We're also seeing drive-in events popping up for our Christmas events that are coming up in December. A lot of them used to be parades or they used to be um, the type of events where your, your customers or your patrons can walk through all of the different Christmas displays you might have put out. Um, so they're looking at switching that to be a drive-through situation, again, with timed entry so that you don't have everybody showing up at the exact same time. Um, so you can encourage people to come within certain blocks of time. Uh, so that's been a really creative way we've seen people adapting some upcoming Christmas events that we've got this December. Temperature checks. This is another piece of technology we've seen. Um, you, you know, it can be as easy as having a monitor stand with a, a gauge at the top. We're seeing, you know, this is in the future sort of thing um, as we look at different types of facility news articles and things that people are starting to develop, um, being able to actually have a booth that disinfects you as you walk through. This is still in development. I don't think it's actually implemented anywhere yet, but it might be kind of the new norm that you start to see. And then for our festivals that are ticketed, um, we are looking at changing up our windows to be less re reliant on having a box office person handing you cash or handing you uh, tickets through the window and making it a little bit more um, automated so that a customer can work on a tablet screen and have the tickets pop out right there through the window for them. We would still have an attendant there to wipe down screens periodically, help if there's any issues, but really trying to reduce the number of touch points that you have with a customer um, in the actual ticket purchasing process. And of course, the contactless payment system. This one is interesting because it was actually, you know, one of those questions that they were specifically asking survey um, participants, does that help you feel more comfortable coming back to an event? And it did seem like it had a, a vast majority of people said they would feel better if they weren't handing money back and forth and just reducing the number of touch points. So um, fascinating for us because it was never a part of our sales strategy to talk about the cleanliness of LastPass when we first started, when we first launched it last year. But it's pretty much the number one selling point when we have people talking to us about it right now. Um, 
and of course being able to add credits from your phone for that so you're not having to interact with with a person uh, face to face to to add credits or of course having kiosk stations where you can just work with a machine. Again, you're gonna to need to have somebody there who's able to clean it periodically, just like we see in the targets and the, and the HEBs of the world, where we've got people who are kind of periodically cleaning these on a routine basis. Um, and lastly, we've, we've definitely been upping our technology capabilities for capacity tracking. So, we have a fair that's open in Missouri right now. And, and, and you know, this is actually the stat that I think people are most interested in is what is, what is the actual experience like for that fair that has come back? And I will say leading up to the fair, we were really nervous um, because of course on social media, there was a lot of, of talk and concern about the mask requirement. Uh, the city had a mask mandate issued about a week before the fair started and Facebook, their Facebook page was basically just entirely a wall of people saying they refused to wear a mask, they weren't going to wear a mask, they felt like it was, you know, obvious, we've heard all the arguments for why people don't want to wear a mask. Um, and so they handled those, they had basically created their stock re responses to what that was going to be, which was essentially we're going to follow guidelines because we want to keep the fair open for you guys. Um, so have your stock responses to what you know are going to be those arguing points, but then kind of also know it's the loud voices of the centers who are going to be loud on Facebook. But once we actually got to opening day of the event, I had two staff members on staff there. They said truly, it has not been a problem. Everybody's got a mask. Everybody seems fine about having the mask. It's not really, it's not even really an issue once you're there on the actual grounds of your event. People are, people are following the rules and the guidelines as they were stated. Um, so don't get discouraged. You are going to have some, some angry folks on your, on your social media, but they don't seem to be coming out to the event itself. The other thing that had us worried prior to the event is we were just really seeing stagnant sales prior to the event. Um, and I would say if you get, if you take into account what the current climate is, it's so understandable. We have uh, several rodeos happening across the country right now, some in Montana, South Dakota, Wyoming, and really what we're seeing is it's not that people don't wanna buy their tickets online in advance, they're just buying them the day before or maybe the week before the event actually happens. But right now there's so much uncertainty. People just don't even know if the event is going to happen and if they want to make that investment. So um, you're going to have to change your uh, expectations of what you think is going to happen with your ticketing. Be looking for more of your sales to come right before the event happens. And that way people will have the comfort level that the actual event is going to happen. And lastly, the last little point I'll make about this, because it's the other kind of talking point that most people seem interested in when I talk about these big gatherings of people that are coming together, everybody wants to know, like, well, how is it looking? Is it actually being successful? And I would say for the, the fairs that have opened, where it's just a GA event, like many of your festivals are, we're looking at about a 40% compared to last year. Um, so not too surprising. It's a number we had kind of been tossing around as, as some expectations that we were hearing from other people in the industry. And now that we've actually had a few um, fairs, fairs mostly, I, I really haven't had any festivals come back yet, um, but we have had some fairs come back and they're looking at about 40% capacity compared uh, ticket sales this year compared to last year. So I know those are the types of numbers that everybody is kind of wanting and needing and, and um, we don't have a ton of examples to pull from just yet, but we're looking at it growing here in the future and um, certainly have more tickets going on sale in the next week or two than we have in months. So that's promising, um, but I think it's really about just making people feel safe and knowing that you're gonna take care of them the best you can. I think that is it. So with that, I want to open it up to any questions. There are some different options for you. There's a questions and answers um, tab within your Zoom meeting call where you can type in a question or there's also a chat window 
where you're able to uh, send us a chat if you have any questions for us. And while we wait for those to come in, Kay, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you if you have any announcements for us. And if you're talking, Kay, it looks like you might still be on mute. Now, am I there? Yep, you're there now. Thanks. Okay, I'm sorry. No worries. Um, I want to thank the speakers uh, for giving their time and their their um, professional opinions and thoughts and their experiences because all of us are in this together and we really need to uh, rely on each other. That's that's how we learn. And so the next event um, will be on August the 20th, two weeks away, same day, same time. Um, I'll announce very quickly what it will be. And I see that we have questions coming. Jessica, can you, can you see them? Or sure, you I sure can. So Diana had asked, can I share which fair was held? We've actually had a couple. Um, Fond du Lac County Fair up in Wisconsin, they did a limited fair. That's the one that I said was um, basically comping all of their tickets, but requiring that you claim your ticket within a certain time slot to come out. But the fair that's actually going in is a ticketed event with full carnival and um, attractions and entertainment and all of that is Ozark Empire Fair. It is currently running in Springfield, Missouri um, and will be going through, I think, the ninth, so through this Sunday, and they started up last Friday, and like I said, that's the one that we're seeing, you know, because we actually have ticket sales to compare from last year to this year, we're seeing about a 40% on that. Uh, the capacity tracking piece of it is nice because you can, you can actually be counting the people as they exit as well, so that you can have an immediate idea of how many people are, are on your grounds at any one point in time which has been helpful for them to be able to communicate with their um, health officials and government officials if they need to be able to say how many people are you having as a max on your grounds, they can, they can pull that data up for them. So those are the two fairs that we've, we've had some success with this year. All right, next one. Um, and this one I might ask Yahaira or Karina to answer. What do you hand out if someone doesn't pass the temperature check second screening? What do we hand out? Um, yeah, um, like we haven't done any temperature checking at, at any of our events. Um, have you been doing any temperature checking? Yes, we, we have done temperature checks. We do temperature checks with employees as well as vendors and um, people who have come to the, the facilities. Uh, mm -hmm. Luckily, everybody has um, has passed the temperature check and screening questions. If they aren't, they are pulled to a secondary area where if, you know, maybe they didn't pass temperature check because it was too hot outside, then we'll give them a minute or two to cool down and then do the temperature check again. Um, if there are screening related questions such as have they been exposed to somebody um, within the last 14 days who has had COVID-19 or if they are experiencing COVID-19 questions, then we would refer them to medical personnel. Perfect. Um, and then how do you handle people who claim face masks exemption? My husband said he'll not be letting them enter the theater even with an exemption, trying to figure out how to handle that for the festival. I think just taking into consideration um, ADA, uh, making sure that we are not, uh, that we're, we're in compliance with ADA always. Um, if it's um, an ADA related reason, then we can see if we can accommodate the patron in any other way, maybe by physically distancing that patron from uh, other patrons uh, even more or by providing some other type of support. Um, that sounds great. The next question on here is the 40% for fares specifically tickets or total revenue for the fare. Uh, that was specifically for tickets. I know that, you know, so much of our revenue comes from sponsorships and, and all sorts of things like that. And, 
And uh, I know Karina and the team out there, Yaida, y'all have done a great job with maintaining sponsorships for the City of McAllen's events um, and making sure that you've got the sponsors incorporated really well, especially for 4th of July, and I'm sure it'll be the same for the Christmas events. The 40% the that I was referring to was specifically for ticket sales. Do you want to touch on the on what you're seeing as far as percentages for sponsor revenue? Uh, well, for Independence Day, we were very um, lucky to have our sponsor revenue cover 100% of our expenses. Um, this time, you know, a lot of it was virtual and we got very creative in terms of how to make sure that we promoted the event, um, you know, in a cost effective way. And uh, so basically the fact that we were tailoring a lot of the activations, the virtual offerings to our sponsors definitely helped us to secure um, their investment, either what they had invested um, in the previous year or secure, the, secure them as new partners for, for the event this year. Perfect. The other thing that I'll add to that, Jessica, is that uh, our sponsorships for 4th of July were actually up even though we did not do the fireworks display. But uh, a lot of that is uh, relationships and of course being able to deliver the ROI that the sponsors are looking for. And, and it's all about relationships and, and we've got to make sure that those conversations start early. Uh, we're already having conversations with our sponsors for our upcoming events, uh, whether we do them live or virtual. And so uh, that's just a conversation that needs to be had and uh, the earlier, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've heard several of my clients mention that um, a lot of their sponsors are saying, you know, they just haven't had as many events to give to. And so they're actually kind of looking for some opportunity to, to give in that way. And so it's a, it, if you are having an event, it could be a good opportunity. You do need to get kind of creative in what you're going to deliver for them. And, you know, I think the city of McAllen has done a fantastic job with that. So kudos to y'all. Thank you. Um, somebody had asked, what mechanism are you using to count attendees to ensure you don't have too many attendees? Um, so the, the mechanism I was specifically talking about was it, within our Sapphire Ticks ticketing tool, we, we built out, as a response to COVID-19, we built out what we call a capacity tracker tool that lets you easily see that count. But I know that we, we've kind of seen it at like the Home Depots of the world where they might have somebody at the entrance um, and somebody at the exit who's just manually counting as people come in and out. So I think there's probably other tools out there, but the one I was specifically referring to was, was our Sapphire Ticks tracking. Karina or Yahida, do you either of you know of a tool to do that? We have, uh, we have overhead counters that they count people as they're coming into the facilities. Um, and we know how many people we have in the facility um, that are coming in and, and the same number that, that's coming out. So I can provide the, the vendor with that, that has that information. Perfect. Another question, my board is interested in hiring a festivals and events professional to monitor attendees adhering to our policies at our outdoor event. Do y'all know of anyone who's currently doing that, especially in South Texas? I personally don't, but I, in addition to Karina and Yahida, I might ask Joe or Kay if you know of anybody as a resource from the association. I, I know a lot of industry professionals that are in need of a job right now because with COVID-19, a lot of industry professionals have lost their, uh, their permanent job. So I would love to refer some people over. And on a side note, uh, referring to that IFEA um, task force meeting that I was on, um, I think that there is uh, talks to have a certification program where um, industry professionals can get certified to make sure that uh, to be, you know, the most knowledgeable, say, person in the room in terms of safety protocols um, when it comes to kind of our new moving forward. So that might be really interesting to keep track of. And the yeah, absolutely. I don't know of one, but I can certainly 
put something out in our newsletter if um, Mary Margaret, you'll send me something on that. I'll be happy to. Uh, also, Jessica, the, there was a, another part to the question you asked. How do you verify someone is an ADA person? They may not be willing to provide information. I don't know that they give out ADA cards. Does anybody have any information on that? Jessica and Kay, and, and I think that's uh, Bo is uh, the one asking. Right. Uh, I think if he'll get with us after afterwards, there are several documents out there addressing all of the ADA uh, compliance uh, issues, and uh, I think we can share that with him. Okay. Uh, the other thing I was going to suggest, Kay, for Mary Margaret's question, this might be something that we as TFEA might want to consider as a service for festivals and events, uh, just like we get the mystery shopper where we can maybe get somebody to come out and and to work with uh, an individual pair and help them with, uh, with some of these tasks. Good idea. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions and I know we're past time and, and uh, People do have other things to do. I do want to remind everybody that the Texas Event Management Institute Fast Track is working and um, running. If you are interested in uh, continuing education to get your uh, certified event and festival and event certificate where you can move on to CFEE as well. Um, please give me a call and I'll get you and help you get registered into the program. And um, if you have any suggestions for topics, I ask each time, uh, please just email me your thoughts and we'll look for, for helpful topics for you as well. Again, thanks to all the, the speakers and uh, to each one of the attendees for helping us make this happen. Any other questions? If not, then we will end the session. Thank you, Kay. Thanks, Kay. Thank you. Thanks.